All right. This is a very exciting one. I have wanted to do this interview for quite some time, and I'm delighted that we're here with Tony Khan, a man who has more jobs than I can count. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how there's enough time in his day, but he gets it done. Of course, you know him from AEW. You know him from the Jacksonville Jaguars. You know him from Fulham. Those aren't his only jobs, by the way, but as far as AEW All Elite Wrestling is concerned, who are celebrating a very important milestone, three-year anniversary on this Wednesday, a huge deal for them since the launch of Dynamite three years ago on TNT. He's the president, the chief executive, the general manager, the executive producer, the head booker, probably some other stuff as well for AEW. He's the great Tony Khan. Tony, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on. How are you, Ariel? I'm doing great. And can I just say, I'm very delighted that you're here speaking to me. Because if I could break the fourth wall, I thought you didn't like me for a long time, Tony. I felt like uh, I felt like we had heat and I didn't know why. And it kind of hurt my feelings. No, not at all. Quite the opposite. I just uh, want people to clear the interviews they do with us. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's had nothing to do with you. But I really like And since then, I think we've done a lot of great stuff in collaboration with you. Um, but it's my first time getting to visit with you in person, even though I think we've been in some arenas at big events at the same time. And uh, now we get to talk together and yes. I'm really excited about it. So I, as somebody who enjoys your show and enjoys your work, uh, this is fun for me. Thank you. I appreciate I wasn't going to bring up the uh, the interview thing that you were talking about, but since, was that was that a shoot or, or was that? Did you word? allude to it? I feel like you alluded to it, though. Right now? Bring it up. Well, when in, like in. Yeah. Why would I not like you? Why would I you don't know. I don't well, like I've you? tried to have you on before and I was having a hard time, but you're a very busy guy and I understand that. I, I get very you, sensitive. You literally let off with that. I know I did. Leave. Well, I wasn't actually referring to that, but I thought it was more because I was told the PR people were mad at me, not you in that regard. And the, I we're think they about were the, frustrated that you circumvented Mandy, who does well, a great job. She does a great job and she never even heard of this thing. And it was like, well, I was sticking up for her and I think she deserves to be stuck up for it because she's awesome. And now sure. you've gotten to know her a little bit, and she's great, right? Uh, actually, I don't know who that is. I deal Mandy with Danny. Is, oh, you have not. Okay. That, so now I, don't. I feel really embarrassed. Danny, <laughs> uh, you've never introduced uh, your boss, who's a really nice lady. And Danny's sitting here on this Zoom. Danny's the man. Uh, Danny's the man. He's the one that Danny's makes all great. this happen. Danny's a great guy. He's an awesome guy. And, uh, you know, through uh, the coordination of, of some awesome people, Mandy O'Donnell, she... Uh, Never heard of this thing. And I don't think Danny at that point, to be fair, Danny, I don't think it heard of it either. So, uh, yeah, but it was well, I'm uh, happy we cleared it up. Well, I'm, I'm this is and we had MJF on uh, in studio on the MMA hour right before the uh, the Queen show. That was a big deal. We'll get into all of that. But can I ask you right off the top? Like, I know you were just coming from another meeting right now for your other. It, I've always wanted to ask you this. If your life was a pie chart, right? Could you break it down for me? Like what percentage is devoted to AW? What percentage is Fulham? What percentage is Jacksonville? One of those jobs is 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 too much for one person. And you're doing three in addition to the true media stuff, in addition to now Ring of Honor. Could you even break it down possibly like in a week or a day, how much you're devoting to each one? Well, I think the world has changed and you're able to multitask now. And so much of what we do is online or in our phones or in our laptops and the way we're talking right now. And years ago, even this conversation wouldn't have been possible without us flying and making a trip to book a face-to-face -face interview. A lot of things are possible now. And the, it's a really fluid thing. It just depends on what time of year, you know, if it's the NFL draft, well, that's a weekend and, you know, dynamites on a Wednesday. And so I can focus then on the draft over the weekend and the draft uh, there's often uh, a football fixture in England during that time. So I'm watching a football fixture in England on the weekend of the draft. And it just so happens the Saturday is my busiest day of the year in the NFL, probably signing up undrafted free agents, which is something I've had the good fortune to find some good ones, including a few players who are with us right now and contributing to the Jaguars. And I like doing all the things I do. I started with football and then my life was, uh, Awake when I was awake, it was almost 100% NFL football. And then uh, a lot of what I do is either automated or in the hands of people. You mentioned True Media, which is a company I own out of Boston, which is managed by amazing people. And they founded the company. And that so I invested with them and then purchased the company. And now together, the three of us run the company and they do an amazing job with that. Uh, Fulham Football Club, super hands on with, but do a lot of it from overseas abroad and have done it that way for six years with the player transfers and 
right now, I think we're in the best position we've been in since my father purchased the team. And when he bought the team, I didn't uh, work in the football side at all. And I had nothing to do with it for several years. And it was only after they'd had, you know, some res bad results and had gotten relegated. And then they almost went down to the third division where in the summer of 2016, I took over doing the transfers and we brought in 14 new players and changed the team. And then within two years, we were back in the Premier League and then we were down and <laughs> we got back up and then we went down and now we're up. And uh, we did it in the best way. I think we've done it yet. The, the squad came together. They won uh, the league championship and our coach Marco Silva is so tremendous. And I think we have a great group of people there, a great CEO, Alistair McIntosh, and I like to oversee the transfers and loans and have done that since 2016 and now do it working with them on zoom the same way we're talking and through the summer we're talking like this every day for hours and it's amazing yeah and to be able to do it now you know so you can do things like that and uh sometimes backstage early in the day during a dynamite might be working on a transfer so wow. this is probably not the stuff uh, that 95%. No, of I'm, the I'm fascinated as someone who has like a lot of things going on as well. Like time management is very interesting to me. So I was just curious how you are able to navigate through all these very different jobs um, and different roles. As I said, Wednesday, three-year anniversary of Dynamite. Congratulations, Mazel Tov, as my people like to say on this massive deal. I'm wondering if you could be honest with me, like, are you exceeding your expectations? If we would have spoken back in October of 2019, did you think you'd be at this point? Are you maybe disappointed? Did you, did you think you would be even further along? Are you are you blowing your, your, your own expectations out of the water? How would you gauge how far you have come in three years? I think we've come an amazing way in three years, and I think we've vastly exceeded any expectations at that point. Uh, when Dynamite launched three years ago, we were not on TBS yet. We were on TNT. And it was because of a big vote of confidence and support of management that we've gotten new opportunities since then. We've grown our portfolio. We're doing more things with Warner Brothers and more now it's Warner Brothers Discovery. And the new management this year has been the best yet for us for AEW in terms of really giving us opportunities. And I think this year, the three-year anniversary uh, show that we have tonight is a great way to showcase uh, everything they've done to roll out the red carpet for us and make this such a special uh, way to celebrate the anniversary with an extra 15 minutes at the end of tonight's episode on TBS, which starts at like 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, as it does every week. But then we have an additional 15 minutes at the end of the show. So it's two hours, 15 minutes live on TBS tonight. And we also have two hours live on TNT for the first time ever. It's AEW Rampage, followed by AEW Battle of the Belts 4. And I'm very excited about the idea of bringing Battle of the Belts to Friday night after Rampage, but it's also pretty interesting trying two hours again. And I can tell you firsthand, the network was really pleased with how we did with Grand Slam Rampage to have two hours perform and have the second hour hold up really well. And that was a really strong performance not only in the 10 p.m. hour for the first hour, but the second hour of Grand Slam Rampage performed very well. And so it's a great opportunity, and I think it bodes well for this Friday. So it's really uh, been tremendous. And this year in particular, we've seen our best run of ratings in the last six weeks. And, you know, it's been challenging circumstances at times, but in many ways, it's been the most stable TV crew I've had the entire year. And it's been uh, really, really great. And the shows have been tremendous. And I think going into the three-year anniversary, it's really fitting that uh, we have some of the best wrestlers in AEW uh, peaking at this great time to have John Moxley, the AEW World Heavyweight Champion. Chris Jericho came out of Grand Slam with a Ring of Honor World Championship. It's Chris Jericho's eighth World Championship. And if you're somebody who follows professional wrestling and if you haven't seen AEW, I tell you no lies. And I swear to you as a wrestling fan, somebody who like really loves it. This is some of Chris Jericho's best work. And I am one of the biggest Chris Jericho fans of 30 years and was a tape trader when I was 12 years old, trading for Chris Jericho tapes in Japan. I was there at his last two matches in ECW in person. My father brought me to the ECW arena when I was 13 years old. And my dad did not like wrestling at all. This was all 
uh, in pursuit of getting me to achieve a higher education because I had been uh, admitted to a school I didn't want to go to and they bribed me by taking me to the ECW arena. And uh, I've followed Chris for a long time and he's done so much for AEW. Like we would not have gotten off the ground. I don't think without Chris, he was instrumental in the launch. His star power brought so much focus to our first pay-per-view in the early Dynamites. And he was the first AEW world champion. Wow. And yeah. And now Chris has peaked in terms of physical fitness. And that's why we were able to bring back Lionheart this year, because Chris is back in that physical condition. Yeah. And as a Jericho fan, you probably know, uh, you know, as a wrestling fan, I believe a huge part of his legacy is like he was a really not only a very charismatic star, really athletic, who had great matches, very physically fit and looked like a great wrestler in his prime. And uh, Chris was, was a huge star from us for the very beginning. But right now, in terms of physical fitness, is the best he's ever looked in AEW by far. He lost 31 pounds this year. Wow. And, yeah, he and, looks fantastic. I mean, his body transformation uh, from last year to this year, incredible. Uh, by the way, I'd be remiss if I don't uh, wish you an early happy 40th as a 1982 baby. So a lot of exciting things happening for you. I think you're turning 40 in the next few days. So congratulations on that as well. Um, you mentioned Rampage. And so you've got Rampage on Fridays. You've got Dynamite on Wednesdays. Do you ever foresee a day where Dynamite is live to two and a half hours, whatever the case may be. And then you're also live in a different venue on Fridays for Rampage. Cause now sometimes, you know, you're taping it afterwards, but this week you're not. So do you ever foresee a day? Would you like that? Or do you think that's not necessary? I don't know what it will do permanently, but I know going forward for the next month, most of Rampage is for the next, I'm really through full gear. Most Rampages are live. Okay. So uh, that's the idea. We're going to step it up going into full gear and step it up for Rampage. So we have Rampage, live this week we're doing a separate rampage show it's actually it's a standalone show but we are doing it uh on a thursday in canada to be honest because it makes a lot of sense with the traveling crew and with everybody up there uh for a lot of reasons to do it over the wednesday thursday rather than keep everybody up there the extra day but uh there's also great opportunities with keeping that venue for two days and the, the business deal we made that was a really good deal and so this has been a big milestone month for AEW because like we're talking about tonight on TBS, we're celebrating the three-year anniversary of AEW with this huge show. Your good friend MJF is going to open up the show in a big match with Wheeler Yuta. It's been building for a long time. Uh, it, I think people are really going to enjoy it. And it's, a you know, to see, frankly, one of the people who was one of the top young stars when AEW launched against who, somebody who has been one of the best young stars for AEW this year. I think it's very cool. And there's a lot of great matches up and down the card that you'll see. I mentioned Chris Jericho and what great condition he's in and how he, how amazing a year he's having. Now he's an eight time world champion and he's going to team with his longtime protege, Sammy Guevara, who's a three time TNT champion for us against uh, Brian Danielson, one of the world's all-time great professional wrestlers, a six-time world champion himself, and uh, his partner, the Ring of Honor Pure Champion, Daniel Garcia, who uh, is kind of been at a bit of an impasse uh, between what I would call uh, pro wrestling and sports entertainment or the force and the dark side, call it what you will, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the right and the wrong. Uh, could I ask, you know, you mentioned MJF, my good friend. Um, I, I think, and I've said this on many different platforms, uh, I think he's one of, if not the best thing going in pro wrestling today, regardless of promotion. Um, I'm, I'm a huge admirer of his work. Uh, he reminds me of, you know, prime 1980s Roddy Piper, uh, the way he conducts himself, just the mic work, everything about him. A few months ago when we did that interview and, and even afterwards, like when he's talking about his contract, and now I think you've done a nice job of kind of blending that into the program as well. And it's stuff that fans, especially of my generation, like we like that stuff and we're not sure what's a work, what's a shoot. He's calling you a mark, all that stuff. Initially, were you comfortable with him talking about, because in the business historically, we don't know when contracts are up. Were you comfortable with all of that? I, this is one of those things that I uh, don't want to talk about, but I do think uh, I agree with everything you let off with. I think he's one of the best wrestlers in the world. It's amazing how much he's accomplished already at such a young age. He's a great talent and I have uh, so much respect for that part of what he does. And, you know, you compared him to Roddy Piper. I think um, I grew up idolizing Roddy Piper, Ric Flair, Chris Jericho, and, you know, he's got, 
the, you know, really uh, some of the qualities of some of my all time favorite pro wrestlers. So definitely agree with all that stuff. And now to have him uh, on the show on a regular basis, it's tremendous. And like I said, the last six weeks or so, uh, the shows have been our best runner ratings of the year. And there's, you know, great stories coming together. And of course, we know MJF can challenge for the championship anytime he wants coming out of all out as the winner of the casino ladder match. And now we have a very interesting situation uh, framing around the world title. We have the world champion, John Moxley, uh, who's also going to be going in to his hometown, Cincinnati, to defend the title as it stands right now against Hangman Page. So that's pretty interesting with Hangman, the former champ, uh, going into Mox's hometown and Max looming. Uh, there's a lot happening in AEW, as I mentioned, but also with uh, Jericho and Danielson. Uh, I'm very excited about something that's going to be happening tonight on AEW. Oh, is that National- a tease? National Scissoring Day. <laughs> it's going to be, uh, you call it a tease if you will, uh, but it's uh, something very, very, very near and dear to all of us in <laughs> AEW that we've watched grow right. from back here in the back of Daly's place, right behind where I am right now, uh, from when the acclaimed was formed and how far they've come. And now they're the world tag team champions. And I think it's awesome. And it's a testament to Max Caster, Anthony Bowens, to Daddy Ass. And uh, also to all the great wrestling fans that supported the acclaimed and supported everything they've done and how hard they've worked to become the champs. It's awesome. And it's it's because of those guys. But also so much of it is because of the fans. And I think it's awesome. Could I just follow up if I may? Like the reason why I'm so drawn to MJF is because he talks about the side of the game. You know, you're a football guy. We love the business side of sports, right? Free agency, transfers, deals. This, I think, is brilliant. So I'm just curious why don't you want to talk about it? Like why this, I think is part of his appeal. And I think it's great for the storyline, his spot in the company. He's going to be a free agent in a year and a half or so. And you're talking about it on the, on the broadcast as well. Yeah. But I don't see how, you know, going into detail about it other than talking about his wrestling and what he brings to the show. And of course uh, you know, everything he brings his great promos, his great ideas, there's a lot there, but, uh, you know, I think you're, you're starting when, if you want to get into the contracts and that aspect of it with me, um, same as my other jobs. If you wanted to talk about the contracts at Fulham, I would probably be kind of vague. I would say like, I really like the player. I think it's good business we're doing. And, uh, I think it's a great transfer that we're making and we're doing a smart move for the club, but you know, you getting into the numbers and stuff, rarely will I do that. Uh, when he was on my show, he just said that he came to terms with you on, on a deal, but not an extension. Can I ask if that was accurate? Yeah, I, I again, I don't want to comment on what okay. we did, but I think uh, I, he's been well compensated and I'm glad to have him on the shows. And uh, he's like a huge part of it now. So it's great. Um, for you, just curious. I know you've popped up a couple of times. Do you have any desire to be an on-air figure, character? you know, authority figure. I, I feel like, no, you, you, you don't want to. Uh... I am a device. And when it is necessary, it can be a very effective one. And we've done 160 episodes. I have made all of four appearances in 160 episodes. All of them did about a million. Some of them were at really every time they were very necessary. Uh, some involved a little bit of talking. Some involved really none. Uh, the only four times I've been on the show were, you know, the most regrettable was at the end of the Brody Lee tribute show. And uh, then there was the purchase of Ring of Honor. There was the announcement of the Forbidden Door. And there was the announcement of the Grand Slam Tournament of Champions. Uh, some of these did over a million, all of them did. But it's, it's not like I'm a big hamper on the TV, but it's also not like a device I go to very often unless it's absolutely necessary. So it's four times out of 160. We're uh, showing up on a very, very low percentage of the show's uh, so if I'm on a, you know, a couple percent, 98% of the time, you're not going to see me. And, uh, it's, I think that's important to note. And, and I'm fascinated by your role. Like, so I mentioned all the titles, but I think the one that the fans are most interested in is, uh, you being the booker, right? I, I think the wrestling observer named you booker of the year for three straight years. If I have that correct. Um, 
It's been two. I've it's the and it's the fans that vote. So sure, the, sure. The, no, the, and that's a huge, uh, you know, um, you know, that's a huge sign of respect from the fans. But you know, we hear about uh, writing teams and stuff. And I spoke to Daniel Bryan or Brian Danielson, excuse me, about this. How like when he came over, no script, and he at first he was like, "Wow, this is amazing, no script." Could you just tell us, like, as far as writing the show, is it really just you, or is it you and several others? And if there are several others, how many people are involved in that? Well, it's me. And I put together an outline every week and have done that for a few years now. And it's it's gone well. And I started doing it that way. And I think things really, you can look at the numbers, like there's a direct line up when I started doing it. And um, it helps me keep everything organized and helps me keep everybody organized as best I can. I think the best thing for AEW is what's happening right now. The opportunity we have tonight and, and going forward this week to have uh more television time for the incredible roster, because I think we have as good a roster as anyone in wrestling, but we don't have seven hours or five hours of TV. Most weeks we have three hours and I'd like to maximize it, but it's incredible this week. We have four hours and 15 minutes of live TV, two hours and 15 minutes tonight on TBS and two hours on Friday on TNT. That's pretty cool. And it's the first time we've ever done four hours and 15 minutes of live TV in a week. So that's awesome to celebrate the three year anniversary. And it's very consistent with the incredible support we've been getting recently from Warner Brothers Discovery. You know, this really has been a banner year for us. And this summer, we've gotten the chance to work on integrations in a really changing media landscape where these are like really valuable opportunities that I think signal where we stand in the ecosystem of entertainment in the biggest content creator on the planet right now. And they're running a really smart business. And, you know, that the new boss brought us in to help promote shark week, which is so important to them. And so uh, near and dear to discovery for good reason, because it's the longest running most successful TV theme week ever. And now, you know, based on doing a good job on that, we got the opportunity to work on house of the dragon and do an entire house of the dragon episode, you know, using uh, footage from the show, using some of their content and, what was awesome is I also think it was one of the best episodes we've ever done. And, you know, getting a chance to bring Ricky the Dragon Steamboat in and work with the Dragon and the Dragon Slayer and have a great two out of three falls match. Brian Danielson, of course, was involved there wrestling with Daniel Garcia. And then tonight they're teaming uh, coming out of that. So it's been building for a long time. There was a lot of respect coming out of that House of the Dragon match, building to that match tonight against the guys who... In the very first episode of Dynamite, uh, paired up Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara. And to have that protege mentor relationship and then celebrate that on the three year anniversary, I think it's it's cool. And to be able to work on the House of the Dragon for HBO, that was pretty cool. And I've worked here for three years now, and that's the first chance I've ever had to work on anything with HBO. Hmm. And then to have the TBS and TNT PR come back and say, you did a really good job and HBO is known for having really high standards and they thought you did awesome. So that's a good sign. And it means a lot to me because I love HBO yeah. and, and now we're getting these great opportunities, but the biggest thing we can do with AEW to me is get more, more opportunities for this great roster to wrestle because I think three hours is amazing and we can do even more uh, with more time and the stability of the roster we've had in recent weeks. We've had this great run of ratings uh, there's a lot of exciting things happening across the shows. I mentioned great champions before somebody who's been a really consistent performer and came over as a free agent, Tony storm. I, me I mentioned the tag team champions who are a homegrown act. We've developed here two individual wrestlers who came together in AEW as a team as the acclaimed and won the titles, but the team they won them from are two of our best free agents we've ever signed both this year, Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland. And so it's been a great group of wrestlers coming together for us. And I really believe uh, across the two hours of Dynamite and the one hour Rampage, there's even more opportunity to do more, which I think we can show this week. Uh, before we got on, uh, we were talking about my good friend, Mark Ramundi. You know him well of ESPN, writing a book on WCW. And I think you would agree we're, we're almost exactly the same age. The best time in wrestling history was, you know, the WCW, WWF, E, Monday Night Wars, right? The competition. When there's no competition, wrestling isn't as fun. Like, we love that, I love right? that era then. But if you asked me then, I was like, oh, well, I wish I was in the 80s. Like, so, uh, I, but me, now was... looking back on it, I, I do 
think that I, might be true, but it's also hard to say what the best era. It's definitely sure. a great era. One of the best, if we want to say that. And I would say that's part of the re- part of the reason why fans were so excited when AEW came with strong backing and big names on the roster because they wanted competition. They wanted, you know, a uh, a Pepsi to the WWE's Coke, um, for lack of a better analogy. Could I ask, um, when you found out that there was going to be a regime regime change over there? What was your reaction? Because I think a lot, I said it myself, I felt the, the the product was stale and I thought that you guys were doing a much better job of keeping fans on their toes and presenting something fun. Now I think their product has gotten a lot better and I think most fans would agree. Did you take that as, all right, let's go, let's let's buckle up. It's going to be a bigger fight, a more fun fight. How, what was your reaction when you found out about these, the, I mean, massive regime chain where Vince leaves and now it's, you know, Triple H in charge? Uh, yeah, that kind of was how I felt. I definitely, uh, I'm always up for the challenge. And I think there have been elements that have seen a big improvement there. And I've been open to say that. I think there's been a lot of improvements there. And I definitely think for us, we've had a lot of big improvements too in recent weeks. And have been like a really rising out. tide lifts all boats, right? Type of thing. I mean, we're both, I, you know, I think both are very competitive and have been very competitive in the past, obviously. And it's, you know, I think in this case now, hopefully going to be good for everybody. Uh, there's probably a bit more similarity in what we're looking for in terms of the profile of a free agent, which I think is already going to start uh, being uh, a thing. So uh, we'll what see do you mean how by this that? goes. I think we're like looking at more similar people. There was definitely something happening this year where there were wrestlers being released from there that came here. Yeah, that I definitely believe belong on national television, worldwide television that are huge stars in AEW. And some of those people, I think, uh, would have made sense. And I don't think if there hadn't been a switch in the person who makes that call, not sure any of those people or not sure at least many of those people would have been released. And then I think we were the benefit. I think think the benefit, you know, the benefit of that was for AEW, I think, because there's some really good names, including some I've mentioned that have come over this year uh, that we're very fortunate to get. And I think um, so there may be more similarity in some of the people we're looking at just based on what I've seen. Considering that, uh, do you think that you will proceed in a different manner in terms of who you let go? Because maybe, you know, uh, let's, you know the Malachi Black situation. There's there's reports out there that you aren't so keen to let him go because there's interest in him on the other side. Like, are, are you, in a previous era, you're like, all right, if I let this guy go or this woman go, they're not going over there. But now, because you have similar interests, perhaps you'll think twice about that. Who have I really let go, though, that wasn't a, either a contract that expired or uh, wasn't for cause? Because I haven't really done a lot of letting or people go for... To- you know, or not fight to keep someone or re-sign someone. You know what I mean? I, it's, you know, I do think there's a more similar profile in what we're looking for, which is probably good because I think the way we're doing things is good. So that they're, you know, they, I think, like I said, there's probably been a lot of improvements since the switch. And I've been pretty open to say that. I, you know, it's not yeah. the first time I've said it in an interview. I'm, I'm like a wrestling fan. I like to you watch the product. Do you even have time to watch their product to see what I, the competition is doing? I watch a lot of wrestling. I watch a lot of wrestling from different places. Do you consider them competition? I said before, I can think all wrestling is competition. Do you, I, I don't know if you've heard me say this before. Uh, some people ask me why I'll talk about other wrestling companies, especially WWE. And I'll tell you, it was a, literally a book handed to me over three years ago before the launch of Dynamite by Warner Media at the time before it was Warner Brothers Discovery. And it was telling me what our place already, because Dynamite hadn't launched, but we had carved out a space in the pay-per-view business where it was clear we weren't a niche business because we had already outperformed every company other than WWE for 20 years. So we were already not just number two, but the biggest number two in the pay-per-view market in 20 years because the numbers we did for our first summer of pay-per-views were bigger than the numbers WCW was doing in their last 18 months of business. Mm-hmm. And um, and then since then, we've, you know, posted numbers that nobody's done since the nineties other than WWE literally. So, um, you know, 1999, we were talking before we started very briefly, just as we jumped on about WCW and I think not, you know, it was, uh, mid to late 99 was the last time they saw those kind of numbers and then never again. And so we carved out a space and they handed me a book and it was how to be a challenger brand. 
this is what you are. A challenger wow. brand, I learned then three years ago, a challenger brand is not the industry leader, but it is also not a niche brand, a niche brand, uh, mm -hmm. tomato, tomato, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it is not uh, uh, that, it is a big company. It is Pepsi, it is Burger King. Uh, it is maybe Arizona iced tea, right? It is a challenger brand. It's a big company, but you know, a lot, many people don't know that they're not the industry leader, but people like them and many people prefer them. And that's why they have a very big base. That's Pepsi. That's Burger King. That's maybe Arizona iced tea. Like I said, I think that's AEW is a challenger brand. So what look at Burger King marketing. What is Burger King marketing? I mean, basically a lot of it is, Hey, McDonald's sucks, guys. Right. So, so uh, and I don't, especially now, like if there's been improvement, I am not like Burger King. Okay. Like I, uh, and I respect the hell out of both Burger King and McDonald's as, as businesses. I'm just using them as, sure, you know, textbook examples, literally for me, educationally textbook examples. And uh, so for AEW, you know, it's just part of what we are. We're a challenger brand. There's no reason to pretend we're not. That's what you are. Embrace it. So it's literally a corporate philosophy handed down on high to me by my boss. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you have to explain that. Of course, uh, they have a head start and you guys have made, I think, I think you've exceeded expectations in the last three years. That's why I wanted to know if you agreed with that statement. Dying to ask you, obviously, about Labor Day. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, by the way, just so you know, I do agree with it. I just wanted to give you because I get asked sometimes that and I thought it was a good way. Sure. To, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, because you you asked about do I consider them competition? Well, sure. I consider them in many ways the industry leader, but I consider us a strong challenger brand and people all the time knock us for our position. And it's like, you know, would you tell the CEO of Pepsi no, like, oh, a you didn't sell as money? bottles is coke would you tell you know and it's it's it, we're a big company it's it's hard you can't really not acknowledge that now. what was going through your mind at that press conference labor day i mean i was just trying to watch you as a uh, punk who i know quite well was you know saying what he had to say i was dying to know what was just happening in your mind in that moment as all that was unfolding could you share any of that with us i cannot share any of that with you okay. uh, but i were you upset what you asked I can't talk okay. about it, but I uh, appreciate, you know, and understand that you had to ask. Fair enough. C could I ask, what is the state of your relationship with CM Punk? You can ask, but I, uh, I appreciate okay. that you asked, but I cannot answer that, my friend. Okay, fair enough. C could I ask, what's the state of his relationship with AEW? Like, is he is he going to come back? Is he suspended? I think there's a lot of uh, intrigue, a lot of questions regarding where he sits right now. I know he's nursing an injury, but... Is he going to come back or is that up in the air? You can ask, but I, okay. I cannot answer that and comment, my friend. Fair enough. And and what about the other particulars involved in the alleged incident afterwards? Can you comment on their status with the company? Are they are they back at least? I am, like, it's the whole thing. I just the can't whole thing talk can't about, talk about, about, it. about it. I don't want to talk about it. I, Fair but enough. it's but you know, I I understand. I had to ask I understand, I understand what you gotta do. Could could I ask this question? I mean, I, I think at one point you mentioned that you felt like your back was against the wall during that uh, press conference when when you had the mic, so to speak. Um, could you explain why you felt that way? Why you felt like you were, and and even afterwards, did you feel? When, when did I say that? What did I say? I, I think you you were saying like you know you you felt like they were coming after you. They put three shows on that weekend, and that was oh a story oh that, that yes could, yes. So, so I just mean like that that was your mindset going into the weekend before all the other stuff happened. And so after the weekend, did you feel even more so? I thought that Wednesday, by the way, after with MJF and Moxley in the ring, like really galvanized and, and really sent a message that like, hey, we're okay. Like everything you guys want to say, we're okay. I thought those were the right two people. But just for you internally, this is your baby. And you're feeling that way going into the weekend. And then the, this supposed stuff happens coming out of the weekend. Did you feel even more so like, man, I, I got to, you know, I got to fight on behalf of my child. Like this is, this is serious business here. This yeah, is, this you know. was absolutely very important coming out of all out, no matter what happened. And then probably more so than ever for us to hit a home run in the weeks that followed. And we have, and we, you know, we had a great show coming out of that in Buffalo and then started the grand slam tournament of champions, went through Albany and then into Queens where we did our biggest live gate ever for AEW Dynamite. Again, we're going on about 160 episodes of Dynamite. And uh, to have uh, over a million dollar gate and be only the second wrestling company ever to do that on television in America. 
and only I think the second company uh, ever for TV in the world for that matter to do it. And it's pretty great milestone for us and a, just a big month of milestones, like you said, with tonight being the three year anniversary of AEW and, uh, you know, this big thing to have four hours and 15 minutes, two hours and 15 tonight on TBS, two hours on TNT. It's a great opportunity. And I think the wrestlers here, the staff, everybody who's come together has really earned it. And, you know, I think we're really, really in a great position now uh, coming out of that. Like you said, I did feel like that weekend we had to put on a great show and then to follow up with something great. And I think the Grand Slam Tournament of Champions, there were some really great matches and we've crowned a great champion. There's a very intriguing situation now with the champion, the former champion and MJF looming and big matches on deck tonight. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, you recently signed a uh, page now known as Soraya, her real name, right? Uh, could I ask, is she going to wrestle for AEW or is she going to be more of a, an authority figure, or just, you know, a manager, if you will? Well, I don't want to say what Soraya's role is going to be yet, but I think that's one of those uh, stay tuned to okay. Dynamite, you know, tonight and Rampage every okay. week and you'll find out uh, what the plan is. But uh, Soraya is tremendous and it's great having her in AEW. She's a, such a recognizable star all over the world. And what a great signing for us in the UK where AEW is by far the number one television wrestling company in the world. Uh, and I have, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up that point that now AEW Dynamite on Friday nights has gotten moved up uh, and we've got a big run of shows now where Dynamite is actually starting on Friday at 9 p.m. Of course, it's Wednesdays here in America. Yeah. Wednesday so Dynamite's night tonight, on Friday tonight. in the UK? It's on Friday. At, uh, now it's been moved up because the ratings have been so strong. We just had our biggest viewership ever. It was We've topped it multiple times now. We had the Quake by the Lake set a new record. And uh, then we had this huge opportunity that they moved Grand Slam up two hours. And now they're looking to move more of the shows up two hours. And Wait, I just think What it's network awesome. is that? ITV. Okay. And so, I, it's, it's free to air. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, great to have um, a direct way to reach all the viewers in the UK. So we have this massive reach in the UK and ITV, similar to our relationships here in, you know, America with TBS and TNT, who have this great history of showing pro wrestling. ITV has got this amazing history of wrestling. And so they're the best possible TV partner you could have. And uh, my uh, my pal Action Bronson did great in his debut. Was that a one-off or will we see more of him? Uh, that I cannot say, but I thought he did tremendous. And uh, both of us have definitely left it open for him to come back. He was tremendous and I really like him a lot. He's was a he better guy. than you thought he would be? Because I, uh, I thought he was like a young Bam Bam Bigelow out there. He's tremendous, right? He was yeah. not only better than I will. I went and watched him train and I gave him the highest praise. Got it. Which is if I didn't know you were Action Bronson, if I didn't know you're this massive international megastar, that's the highest praise you can give a celebrity wrestler is you were so good that if you told me this was somebody we're going to bring in, a new guy, we want to try him out on Dark, I would say tremendous. He looks like he'll fit right in. So mm -hmm. that's the highest praise you can give a celebrity wrestler. I think he's crossed over where he's, he's he could really do more. So Action Bronson was awesome and really great guy. What a really nice, respectful, just cool the man. Cool man. Legend. Uh, can I ask you about one? Not sure if you can respond, but uh, you know, I wouldn't be me if I if I didn't try. Uh, I thought when Wyndham Rotunda was let go from WWE that he would have been a natural for you guys. Obviously, he hasn't signed with anyone. We don't know. There's rumors he might be coming back. Did you ever have a conversation with Wyndham or his management about coming to AEW? I don't want to talk about like people I haven't haven't talked to, but he's a great guy. Uh, okay. I think I've said this in interviews before, so I wouldn't be giving anything away. I think I see he was at Chris Jericho's birthday party. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I've never uh, talked to him about uh, that kind of a thing uh, in person or anything. So I, I uh, think he's a tremendous talent and uh, you know, I wouldn't, the same as I said before, I wouldn't want to like comment on stuff with, you know, people, specific negotiations or, who we totally understand. Um, in, in, on a football team, right? Like when you're the GM of a team, there's obviously people who work for you, that work with you. There's, you know, director of operations, things like that. There's a whole, there's a whole scout with you with signings. Just curious, like what is the process? Is it, is it you? Do you have a person that you really lean on and say, 
Should we, you know, should we sign uh, Danielson? I know every situation is different. I understand Moxley. That one is like a no-brainer. I of mean, I, mean, I don't need any help with that. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but then, like a, yes, yes, there's a huge group of How's that process people. go? Well, there's a big group of coaches and executives. And okay. we've recently promoted some of the, you know, high-performing coaches and producers to the vice president level. And we have a great group of uh, executive, executive vice presidents, vice presidents, coaches, uh, and uh, different people in the organization who bring people in. Sometimes it's a wrestler and uh, that scouts somebody and bring them in. And at the end of the day, I have to decide if I'm going to sign them and put them on the roster and pay them. Um, but it, it's changed how we do it because at one point, I think AEW Dark was the premier tryout system in America. And we weren't the only ones scouting it. There are plenty of people who would tell you that uh, you know, WWE was recruiting off AEW Dark during the pandemic. And it would be, you know, if anybody says I'm that's not true, okay, whatever, you're full of shit. <laughs> so uh and so yes, uh, I do think we've had a really good system of coaches and production people. So you asked me about putting the show together before too, and to touch on that. I mean, so I'll put an outline together, and there's a lot of people I'll run stuff by, but um, you know, I'm trying to talk to a lot of different people about ideas. I'll sit down with um, a group of people like on timing the show, making sure I have all the breaks, right. Cause we have to make sure we get the commercial breaks in the show. Cause that's important. Cause that's how you get paid and that's our job. And then, you know, of course um, announcer copy and, and more specifics transitions uh, wraparounds and things like that, that we put into the show, but I'll come in with an outline and I'll sit down with, uh, you know, Tony Schiavone, QT, uh, a couple people backstage, Sanjay has become really valuable. And, uh, then there's a lot of people throughout the years, you know, that you'd go to whatever their stuff is, you know, I think there's specific people, even if they're not, um, working in an office job per se, that you'd go to like a Chris Jericho, Brian Danielson, John Moxley, um, and of course, you know, people who are working, you know, even office jobs like Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks and, um, CM Punk and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, different people that would come in with ideas. And then, uh, you also, um, have, you know, people that, uh, just a good amount of people that'll just pitch me an idea and a lot of times I'll mark them down and it's something we can fit in. I'll, I want to do them, but the biggest thing is I would love to have more time because I think it would pay off and everything would get stronger if there were more hours of TV. It's why I'm so excited about tonight getting the two hours and 15 minutes on TBS and on Friday getting the two hours on TNT because it's the most live TV we've ever gotten on either night, let alone both. And, you know, it, there's a cool milestone with the anniversary to make it all why we're getting it. And uh, now I think based on Grand Slam and the, and the, the, lead up to Grand Slam doing so well, it bodes really well for us. I know we're up against the clock. Do you have time for three more questions? Is that I'm not up against the clock. Oh. I may, I'm good for you. Oh, they I'll, told me. I'll hang on. No, 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 not oh, for you. Okay. I was You're stressing cool. looking at the clock this whole time. Okay. Oh, well, please. I won't keep you very long. No, I don't know. This isn't, I'm enjoying it. It's great. I appreciate it. Um, could I ask you about ROH? Is ROH please. going to be a standalone thing or... You know, now Jericho, like, is there ever going to be a time where ROH is going to be an actual broadcast entity on a network? I would like to do a weekly ROH show. I don't know where it would live. I think based on the very close relationship I have with the largest content creator in the world, Warner Brothers Discovery, it makes a lot of sense to do it hand in hand with them however I can. So my first step was trying to introduce them to Ring of Honor. And our first foray into Warner Brothers Discovery doing anything with Ring of Honor is I've integrated some of the Ring of Honor championships and champions into the show. And now we have huge names. I mean, you know, Chris Jericho, Samoa Joe, FTR, Mercedes Martinez, uh, and now Daniel Garcia is a young champion. But the four people, excuse me, five people I named before that, those are some of the best TV wrestlers we've had in the last decade or multiple decades in some cases, like, you know, so... I definitely think um, for me, I would love to do a weekly show, but my first step, because you got to crawl before you can walk, especially when you're dealing with such a massive and prestigious company like Warner Brothers Discovery is 
my first step was to do a pay-per-view with them, Death Before Dishonor, which we did in July. And it did very well. It more than tripled the projections and, and they were floored by it. And it actually would be one of the two biggest Ring of Honor pay-per-views of all time in 20, now Ring of Honor has been around for over 20 years. And some of the biggest names in wrestling have come through there. And frankly, now I would even say before me, some of the biggest names in wrestling have booked it. And uh, so it's really cool. I think we're hitting new highs with it. Now uh, with Chris Jericho, one of the biggest stars ever in TV wrestling, in the TV wrestling era, he would definitely be on anybody's list of the biggest names and the people who've accomplished the most. And now to have him an eight time world champion holding the ring of honor belt, it's very cool to have Samoa Joe, who's a huge wrestling star. I don't need to tell you. And somebody that uh, has made headlines all over the world as the ring of honor world television champion. That's a big deal. FTR, one of the top tag teams in the world, uh, holding belts all over the world in the ring of honor world tag team championship. And they've been in the main event of death before dishonor. You know, that was awesome. And so the performance of Death Before Dishonor bodes really well to doing more, more pay-per-views and hopefully a weekly show somewhere in the Warner Brothers Discovery ecosystem would be awesome. Uh, you, you remind me a little bit on social media of like a young Dana White, a 2009 version of Dana White, because you're not afraid to go back and forth with people. He doesn't do that much uh, of that anymore. And you don't see a lot of executives do that. But even when it comes to football, when it comes to Fulham, when it comes to AW, you're very active on social media, not just posting things, but replying as well. Uh, do you ever sometimes get heated about something and reply to someone and then say, eh, maybe I shouldn't have done that or why give in or why even engage in this? It's a way, like, did you ever have those moments? I certainly do. I'm just curious if you ever do, because you're not afraid to go back and forth with people. No, not really. I think it's great. Uh, it's great engagement with the fans. It's great engagement with people. I love, uh, connecting with the fans, hearing what they think. I was an online wrestling fan and I grew up in an age where there was some connectivity and then it got taken away for a long time. And then Twitter really brought it back. And with such a uh, unique platform where, you know, so many of the people in wrestling are on one social media platform and it's communicate, you know, it's not, it's about writing and it's very much up a wrestling person's alley trying to write a witty quip or trying to sum up a story in a tight thing. So, um, I really, really like it. And, uh, I, you know, I think it's all in good fun. So, you know, you can't, you got to really look forward to in life. And <laughs> that's why I'm looking forward to tonight on yes, TBS yes. and Friday on TNT, as you know, and, uh, yeah, you I, I think, you know, and, and, and for me, you know, did, did, were you ever on AOL? Cause we're the same age. Of, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, did you do wrestling stuff on AOL when you were a kid? Like the message boards? Yeah. No, not really. Before AIM, like when it was like dial up. Yeah, yeah. I know there were other ones. I'd go on like Scoops Wrestling and and Raja, I think it was, but I was Well, never... those are websites, but like I mean yeah. like the actual like dial up like No, no. disc like CD-ROM. No, AOL. no, I'm Canadian also cuz AOL wasn't as big of a deal over there. Did it was it you have Prodigy or was there anything like what that? We have. I had Netscape. I had maybe I did have Prodigy. Yeah, there's CompuServe, Netscape, AOL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. AOL early on like the early version of the buddy list, I had like right. wrestlers on the buddy list and you could do like Brian Pillman Sr. And what? DD, you're just, DDP. you're just chatting with them. Yeah. You just I, legit. Text, How'd yeah. you know it was them? It was uh, because like, well, people I knew in wrestling confirmed oh. it was them. Okay. And also like DDP gave me tickets. Oh, and, wow. Uh, <laughs> and wild. then um, uh, you had uh, Lou Fez on there. Wow. And, and I told, I was 12 That's years old and I was trading tapes and um luthez put a book out and he was promoting it on there and he was like sending copies of his book and it was like you know it was luthez on AOL. well and uh i asked him about people i liked and he had like a lot of respect for rick flair he told me buddy rogers was the best and i go back and watch it and it's like i really like him enamored by buddy rogers i just think he's so great and it's like the way every time he hits the ropes, it doesn't look like a thing that he's done a million times. It looks like it's he doesn't want to be doing it. And uh, it's he's just been whipped in violently and he's got six different ways to do it. And they all look different and cool. And uh, he just does so much awesome stuff that you wouldn't expect to see. And he's so charismatic. And I talked talk to him about how I love Mid-South Wrestling 
and, you know, the Watts, Mid-South, UWF. And I was a big fan of that stuff. And Luthez told me, I don't know if it's true or not. He told me uh, Bill Watts carried a gun and okay. uh, that he would, and I'm 12 years old at the time, mind you. Yeah. And uh, that uh, Bill Watts had carried a gun and that's how he kept people in line. Well, I'm definitely not carrying a gun. <laughs> and uh, so I assure you of that. Um, speaking of tweets, uh, I have to ask you about this one because uh, Dave Portnoy of Barstool uh, I think confused you and Nick Khan, who I, anytime I talk about Nick, I mentioned he used to be my agent. So we have a relationship. Uh, and, Would you and like to read Dave's tweet? Would I like to read it specifically? Yeah, yeah sure. Do you want me to pull it sure, up? Sure, I would love it. Uh, because you want me to read it because he took a shot at Nick? Is that why? No, I just think you're like if you want to tell people what he said and For why context? it was like a why. Well, yeah, the context I think would be fascinating. Sure. Let me let me pull it up here if I can get it real quick. I'll do this. Uh, I'll do this live unless he. Uh, unless he deleted you got it. post-production, we can tighten this up. Or no, I can just no, keep listen, the people, like to... I'll just keep the people going. No, uh, no, no. So there was a tweet, uh, I think it was from um, uh, Robbie, right? You did an interview with Robbie for My Mom's Basement. I was on with Robbie in this chair yes. on this d- device. And Robbie told me about this. And then he read it to me. And I was stunned because I thought he was talking about me. And I was like... Cause I was like, I didn't know what I, none of it. I didn't do any of this. Right, <laughs> so right. I was no, like, no, no. Why does he think and I did he that? cleared it up afterwards. So basically uh, Robbie said that he was interviewing you, Tony Khan on Monday. And then uh, Dave quote tweeted it and said, when he got to Barstool Van Talk, oh, sorry. When he got Barstool Van Talk canceled, why did he then invite me to sit next to him at a fight at MSG as his guest and pretend that I didn't know he was responsible? Did he think I was stupid or that I just forget? Or is he just that two-faced? And then... Um, someone else from uh, Barstool whose name is a big cat, big cat, cat. right? Then uh, explained that he's talking about the wrong con, which is crazy that there are two cons in the, in the wrestling business, but that's how these things go. Unrelated, of course. And he explained wrong con. And then uh, Dave, big then, cat. what's up? Big cat. Yeah, Sorry. big cat. And then Dave quote tweeted that again, quick correction. I got the wrong con. Tony, we like Nick is the guy who is full of shit. Carry on. And I think that's where it ends. Oh, no, there's and then, one more. There's, one, there's more. one more. There's you, uh, right? No, is that no, the one Dave you're referring one to? More. Dave has one more too. Uh, I'm just trying to pull this up. Nick got it canceled. Now I have to get to your tweet. You said something to the effect of you couldn't be more different. Um, yeah, I did I'm, say that. I think Dave got one more dig in, but yes. Again, my uh, fault. Oh, Nick is a snake. There it is. Yeah. But you said uh, two more different people we could not be. Here's to not being two-faced. Here's to the big week on AEW TV, the AEW Dynamite three-year anniversary Wednesday on TBS, our first XL two-hour 15-minute episode Friday, the first ever live two-hour AEW Rampage Battle of the Belts on TNT. There it is. So in case you were thinking that I wasn't trying to read, I was just trying for brevity to... Uh, you really you really gave it the whole uh, thing. The whole Thank spiel. You. Thanks, pal. Have you ever met Nick Khan? No. So how do you know that he is two-faced? Like, I'm just wondering like where the feud comes from. Like why, you know, I, to the best of my knowledge, he hasn't taken any shots at you publicly. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You would know. I would more. rather somebody take shots at me publicly. Why? I would rather, uh, you know, I, I have no problem with if somebody has a problem with me saying it to my face. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I The stuff. So why do you feel like he is two-faced why do you feel i didn't say i I, dave said that i said dave i you know we're two completely different people and then i promoted my show two more different people we could not be here's Here's to not not being two-faced because i'm not the guy you're talking about so why are you two different people like you're you're both in the wrestling business well first of all i wanted to do uh, that's buddy rogers right uh to a nicer guy it couldn't have happened right so yeah uh, so, uh, two more different people we could not be. So, um, so first of all, it's a buddy Rogers f- f- twist on words. And second of all, um, it's, uh, true. Cause we're totally different people. I love the nuts and bolts of the wrestling business. And I've never claimed to be, uh, the, the power player agent person, although I am a partner in a, a talent management company. So I, you know, I am in some ways. Uh, that is part of what I do, but we do two completely different things. Um, there's definitely some intersections of the things we do, but I think we do them in very different ways. And uh, we're two completely different people. I don't know that's what to fair. say. No, no, that's fair. I, I saw one time you did, uh, 
you cut like a promo on him with the sunglasses with Shivani. And so that's when I go back to, you know. Now, now want- think about that. Now, if, like, let's add the context to that. Now, when did I do that and why did I do that? Can I do a wind horse? Do you like? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that thing. Yes, yes. Uh, Utah Jazz. What's yes. going on in Utah? What's happening in Utah? What happened? So, uh, if I may, uh, why did I do that? Well, yeah. uh, the, I read online and every wrestling news site at the same time reported that New Japan was going to start working with WWE. And I had active plans with New Japan. I had literally just reunited Rapungi Vice on Dark Elevation. And then I had plans for Yuji Nagata to come in and challenge Mox for the IWGP US champion. And Mox, one of my biggest stars, is their US champion. So there's like some intersections and we're starting to like, the ice is thawed. We're like working together at this point. And I I read this online and I just, again, I'm going to ask straight out. I called and I asked Rock and I said, like, Rock, is this what's going on? Is it, is it true you guys are talking to them? And if so, do you still want to do all the stuff? Because I, you know, do you want to do Nagata Mox or, and is there a future in all this stuff? And I've got a really good relationship in New Japan and in particular Rock, who I would, you know, go to bat for as a human being. And then he has become the go between me and Ghetto. And we built a really profitable trust between the three of us that way and um that picture of me mox and ghetto i think rock took it um that i posted you probably saw that i assume because you're very yeah and um so uh i have all the respect in the world for ghetto and rock and i called him and said is it you know what's up and he said no we're with you there's nothing to it like um we want to do this with you and that's how we're gonna go and then i said well it's getting a lot of press and today's wednesday so I'm thinking I should probably do a promo to get some buzz because also Dynamite had been that night. There was a time shift. It was like during the playoffs. Okay. So um, it was like on at a different time. So I was like looking for something anyway and uh, to give a little bit of buzz. So um, I, you know, we did that uh, before we went live and it definitely got people talking because it's been a year and a half and you're talking about it, but it was also true. Because I did say, like, which part was true though? Because w- w- was that, that, that one, that of, the four, was that one of the four appearances, or does that one not count? That's not on TV. That was on social right. media. But that's a character, right? Like you're wearing the sunglasses. Well, I've done a million promos on social media. I I'm talking about taking up the TV time from the wrestling stories. I, I, like I said, I've made four appearances in 160 episodes of Dynamite, and I think I slipped out once to get Fuego the contract on Rampage. So yeah, and we've I, done a few I, I hundred can, shows, and do I don't like, show up. By the way, that question wasn't me saying, like, you're taking up too much. TV. I think you, sh- you could be on every episode. No, like, no, no, no. We don't need to do I'm that. I'm just saying that felt like a promo rather than when you've been on. Like, when you're announcing Ring of Honor, you're not in character. That felt like a character. That it's, was, you, that, was my wrestling, only that was my wrestling one, character. Yeah, that, that was a okay. wrestling character I was doing that summer. Is that the only time we've seen the wrestling no, character? No, if you remember, you're a very plugged-in wrestling person. You remember that when Kenny was the also the Impact Champion, that I was basically touring with Kenny as his promoter. Mm -hmm. and doing promos and tony shivani and i would go on impact and plug dynamite tomorrow night or or you know and and have like uh the card for the show um so it would it would be like we would go on and plug our own stuff and i would really really uh very often um well this is kind of funny you know in working with new japan it's funny but you mentioned that because it comes up all the time but what I was about to say was the promo, because the promo was saying, like, if you, hey, every wrestling site basically today reported that WWE is going to work with New Japan. Yet here I am with the U.S. champion on the show tonight. I've got Yuji Nagata coming to Dynamite. I just reunited Rapungi Vice. And, you know, we're the ones working with New Japan. So I think all the wrestling sites need to cool their jets because this isn't true. And maybe watch Dynamite tonight, uh, you know, at the time. Now it's on TBS. Back then it was on TNT. And it was a promo for my own show. But it was also saying, like, hey, if you read online that New Japan's not working with AEW, that they're going to work with WWE, that's not true. Because AEW and New Japan have a very strong relationship. Here's why. And then I explained it. And I had heard Nick called them. And that was why I did it. I've also told him this since. So, uh, like, I've not, like, you know, it was not, like... It was just an honest thing. It was, yeah. You said you said that to Nick. Yeah. Oh, so you have talked to him. 
Not in person. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but uh, but yeah, semantic. you asked if I'd seen him. In oh, you've person t- you had conversations. I'd, I'd even know that. You've had yeah, conversations with him? Before. Yeah, I've spoken about, about what? But, I don't know. Really but, uh, but, uh, but, but nevertheless, but, uh, I have, was it a positive conversation? Was I a, don't want to uh, get in, if I may. But uh, again, this is you recent? may. I understand why you ask, but okay. I can't. Uh, by the way, shoot right now. I'm shooting. I had no idea you've ever talked to him. That's why I asked the question. It wasn't like. Well, yeah, I'm a super transparent. I mean, I haven't met him, but I have talked to him. And was it, it was after this. I don't want to say. Okay. But uh, but I did tell him and it was like, it's not per- It was just that's what it was. It was like New Japan. I read this. I've got, you know, I'm heading over to Daly's place to do dynamite uh, out of my home because at least, you know, I was in my own backyard. It was nice. It was like a two minute drive to the yeah. building every day. And uh, and it was right behind my office here. So that part was good. And um, it was ended up being in many ways, you know, we made the best of a very difficult time. And at that point, the New Japan relationship was was a fresh thing. So it was big for us. And now look a year later, it was probably, I don't know the exact timing on that interview. I have to think it was probably like just over a year before forbidden door. Probably like, I think it was on the run, on the run up to double or nothing. So it was probably like, you know, 13, 14 months before, um, forbidden door, probably 13 and, uh, maybe 13 and a half. And, uh, so, you know, look at where it ended up, where we ended up doing over a million dollars on a live gate. Over now, I you know a, a big pay per view number. I think we're I, off the top of my head. I think over one hundred and thirty thousand buys for Forbidden Door now, maybe more worldwide. And it was a huge success for both companies. It's the biggest debut of any of the AEW pay per view franchises, and that partnership has yielded millions of dollars. So that's why I went out and said what I said because it's like it was important to me, and also it was important to the show because if if we weren't going to do Mox versus Nagata, I needed to know then and there. Right. And also, I wouldn't have done that without talking to New Japan. I was like, Rock, why don't you ask Ghetto? Should I do a promo? It's probably good for all of us, right? Like, I'm not saying anything salacious, true, because I think they told me Nick did call them and uh, that, you know, that there was, they weren't going to do anything with it. So that's did why you that say was fun. In the phone call, can I ask, in the phone call, did you say there's only room for one con in this business? Did you say that to him? I cannot, I can't say. Nothing. Wow. <laughs> You're really stonewalling me here on this. No, one. I've given you, I think I've given you a lot. No, you have, you have. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm trying. What is your best. relationship? Like, do you talk to him, you know, a lot or I was it just, I can't, okay, I can't, you can't. But I, I, uh, but I, you know. Have you ever have... talked to Triple H? Yeah. Recently? No. Stephanie? Yeah. Recently? No. How long ago? I, a long time ago. <laughs> I, I would say I would was actually. Was this pre-AW? Like, yeah, I, I I think we all used. To, I thought we were friends. Actually, I think oh. we used to be friends. So well, now um, you're. I mean, more competitors than friends, right? I mean, maybe. No, I was not a competitor at all. I was a football. Oh, now. Player. Yeah, now I haven't seen him in a long time, but you know, I wish him the best. They were. They used to. Was really it about nice. like doing work with your family? I was. A, I'm a big wrestling fan. I was, and I have a lot, a lot of friends around, and uh, I'm also in Florida, and they were in Florida, so um, it's a small world, and uh, they were really nice to me. You know, once upon a time as a football owner. And, uh, you know, it was a different, totally different time. Sure. But, uh, yeah, it's been a long time. Do you think that's the right crew to lead them in as a wrestling fan? Like, is that the right trio to lead them in this new era? I don't know. Time will tell. Uh, time will tell. It's, a it's a really interesting time in the wrestling business though. Uh, lots happened, uh, in the few years, uh, you know, I'm in this office where I worked down, this is my 11th season working for the Jaguars. And to think all the changes I've seen, I mean, things happen fast. Uh, you know, the expression, it's not, we don't only use it in the NFL. That's the expression they use everywhere. That's life in the NFL. <laughs> and uh, that's life in the NFL. It's the same in AEW. Uh, it moves fast. And uh, I think it works across wrestling. It's a really unique space we've carved out for ourselves. Yeah. I think, you know, you're really close to it. There were like three companies and I'm here in this office. That's what makes me think of it you know, through the pandemic lockdown, really, there were three companies all out of Florida, two of them out here out of Jacksonville, right around this, this entertainment complex. Uh, And it was WWE, of course, UFC and AEW were the three shows that really kept going through Florida. And that's how Dana and I got close in the first place. That's how I became friends with Dana White and Hunter Campbell and the people at UFC. And Dana has been so cool to me 
And, you know, that it's a great compliment to me when you say it reminds you of Dana, because I just have so much respect for the business he's built. And again, somebody who's been really, really nice to me. I, them, I don't see as a competitor at all. And except that it doesn't make sense for us to put on our shows against them because UFC is the 800 pound gorilla and Dana's my friend. And why would I want to do that? It's like, it wouldn't, it's dumb business to begin with. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think you moved one show, right? There was a pay-per-view and then you moved it because it was on the same night as a UFC pay-per-view. Um, I have avoided, I have, I moved some of the shows to Sundays yeah. to avoid the risk, but also yeah. there's no risk of intersecting with football in the first three quarters for us. Sure. And it's really not until we get into Q4 around full gear or any other uh, opportunities on a, on a sat, you know, Saturday is where we run this pay-per-view full gear, November 19th, um, not to compete with the NFL. And then I also, when I do do, when I do run Saturdays, I try to not go head to head with the UFC because that would be really dumb. Do you think we'll ever see a world where you go head to head with WWE, where you go to head to head with raw or SmackDown? On that, you know, basis? that's not really my choice. Like I don't decide when the show is on the original business model of this company, to be honest with you, it's now that we're on Wednesday. This is good promotion for when Dynamite uh, on October 18th, not tonight on TBS on Wednesday, tonight. But we do a Tuesday show uh, October 18th because of a playoff game. And so it'll be kind of like the old days head to head. And, um, you know, my you original NXT. idea. Right. Yeah. But my yeah. original idea for AEW and part of the business plan, to be honest with you, was Tuesday was opening up in October of 2019. And my original idea was to launch a day sooner than we did because there had been a lot of condition. People had become conditioned to watching wrestling then. And I, there were a Tuesday or Wednesday were the only days I was going to do it. And it was like, if you want me to put my life into the, I'm going to start a wrestling company. I'm going to do the TV one of these days. And if you want to carry it, it's going to be one of these two days. And um, because I couldn't do any other day. Got it. And, um, and Friday, I could also do, but I didn't think it made sense with, unless it was where Rampage is. But I also didn't think that should be the first show we did rather than the second show. I thought that made a lot of sense for the second show for the time slot that we launched after we'd already launched a successful standalone show. But my original idea was to launch on Tuesday a day sooner um, because there were millions of people conditioned to watching then and we would jump in. But Wednesday open was, was more open for Turner because of the basketball conflicts, because I know about Thursday basketball, I had already thought about, and I would never go head to head with the Thursday night football games, um, such as Jaguars versus Jets on December 22nd. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so I, I, I don't want to, uh, where, you know, where do you live? Uh, I live just outside of New York. Yeah. Well, if you want to come to the game here, we'd love to have you. Oh yeah. Um, what is it in, uh, in New York or is yeah, it? Or yeah. Yeah. It's a MetLife stadium on uh, December 22nd. I appreciate it. We'd love to well, I get like the full royal treatment, like on the field, yeah. shake hands with Trevor. I'm a Bills fan, by the way. I didn't like the win last year. You guys beat us. It was a shocking loss. I would argue the worst loss of the season, if I'm being honest. Is that, I don't know if that's disrespectful to the Jaguars, but it was just a really low moment for the team. Our expectations were a little higher, but you guys are doing pretty well now, two and two. It's a nice, you know, it's a nice little start, right? Doug Peterson's so awesome. Yeah. Doug so and Mike winning. Caldwell, the new staff. and I wasn't and a big Doug Marone guy, if I'm being honest. Really? Oh, I, because you're, you're a Buffalo fan. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't. Mm. Well, you also, I mean, Doug did win a playoff game. He did, also against Buffalo. but he kind of left us high and dry. Yeah, but I mean, he also won a playoff game for us against Buffalo. Yes, I remember the uh, Tyra Taylor. That was in a, a high moment for our Paramount. our franchise. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, on, on the uh, he he was the Bills quarterback. No, Nathan um, Nathan Peterman. No, no. Nate, well, he got injured towards, but I think Taylor played the beginning of that game. Uh, Peterman, yeah, we tried to erase Peterman from our memories. Um, c can I ask, I think one of the biggest stories of the, the rest, of, and, and I'll let you go in a moment, uh, the biggest story. Oh, no, no, this is great. You're loving this? Okay, great. I'm really enjoying it. Okay, cool. Are you uh, are you jammed for time? I'm not, but uh, I was told you had 45 minutes. That's no, all. I'm not. Uh, I drank this entire cup of coffee and this entire water. I want, you mind, can you hang on one second? Is oh, okay, gonna screw sure, you, sure. Is this going to screw you in post? No, no, it won't. All right, you guys got this? All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, hey. Okay, yeah, cool. All right, I'll keep going. Um, 
So as we sit here today, I think one of the biggest stories, if not the biggest story as far as wrestling is concerned in 2022 was Cody Rhodes coming over to WWE. Did you try hard to keep him? I, I still can't almost believe that he, he left. I mean, he was part of the foundation of the company. Did you try hard to keep him? I can't, I, again, we're in the realm of stuff I can't talk about, but I have a ton of respect for Cody and uh, really like Cody a lot and uh, wish him the best in everything he's doing. Uh, Was it surreal for you to see him over there after, you know, being sort of in the trenches with him for three years? I can't talk about it. I definitely. Why can't uh, you talk about that? I don't want to talk, because I don't think it'll serve me well. And, uh, but I do think he's, he's great and have a ton of respect for him. And, uh, it says a lot about him that, you know, in a year where uh, Vince McMahon uh, well, I mean, from a, retires. From a wrestling standpoint. That, that from a wrestling no, I'm business. not saying it's not. I think Cody moving is a huge story for the wrestling business. And I think it says a lot that in a year where uh, Vince McMahon comes back, and I was about to say before that Steve Austin came back and wrestled right. this year. So, and it says a lot that uh, Cody jumping is right there is one of the biggest stories in pro wrestling. And, uh, I have a lot of respect for Cody and like him a lot. How, how would you describe Tony the, um, the 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 mood in the locker room right now? Like, how would you describe the? You know, when I did my MMA Hour show uh, the week after everything happened, and I said, you know, maybe in retrospect, and this is me, you know, being hundred percent transparent, I said maybe you know the inmates were running the asylum, and, and Tony needed to like you know reel things back in and be you know the boss. Uh, now it feels like things are good, but do you, do you feel like there's any truth to that? Like where the wrestlers were kind of being the bosses and that could sometimes lead to issues. Would you say that the, the mood has changed? Well, like I said, I'm not Bill Watts. I'm not, uh, enforcing things that way. I think the world has changed a lot and, uh, I have a lot of really good relationships with the people here. And I think it's come across in the way we've been able to put a great company together so quickly, build this great roster. And now we have, you know, this great track record of success. And uh, I don't necessarily think that was the case, but I do think, uh, you know, right now we're in a really good place as a roster, as a company. In retrospect, though, do you wish you had made different moves when you started? No, no, I think I did, uh, you know, everything. And I also don't like looking backward. You can't really do that unless you're going to look at how you're going to look forward off of it i don't think it serves well and also like you said i'm pretty busy i don't necessarily have the time uh to do that so it's pretty uh important to me to make sure that we're surrounded by really great people and most importantly i want to make sure that everybody comes to work and feels like you know it's a it's a good place to work and i want to make sure that everybody gets opportunities but really at the end of the day Everybody who's come to AEW knows coming in, there's a sense of security here that they haven't had necessarily at other wrestling promotions. A lot of the people I've brought in were part of layoffs and cost cutting and not like desperate cost cutting times are tight cost cutting. It's like record profits cost cutting. And if I was making record profits, I probably wouldn't be laying off dozens of people. So that's, uh, some of what I'm talking about when I talk about compassion and being a good boss. And frankly, when I talk about, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily the same guy as some person who shares a surname. <laughs> why, 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 why do you have to say it like that? Why can't you just say his name? Why, well, who, who's that? Nikon. Nikon. Oh. <laughs> You've talked to him on the phone. You probably talked to him more recently than I have. I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I do know that tonight, is the three-year anniversary of AEW Dynamite. And That's I'm right. very excited about it. And I got to tell you, uh, this has been a great first appearance uh, on your show. I, I really appreciate, appreciate you having me on. And you know, I feel you're, like you're wrapping me up here. So I'm not. Uh, I'm not. No, no, I it's think, okay. No, it's I'm okay. I'm not. I'm saying that. Uh, I appreciate you know, it. I, I think I, this was good. I think we've done uh, a lot. We've done a lot. We, we, we've said it all. We've done it all, as Howard Stern likes to say. I stretched. You stretched. You went longer than your 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 you know your PR told me forty five, and I respected that. I always try to respect people's time. I actually asked repeatedly if you had a hard out because I wanted to be respectful of your time. I guess I did, and I screwed up, and I didn't realize I had something right behind this. But then that's. I'd okay. like to think you were enjoying this so much I was. that you just. And we were making up for lost time because uh, I don't know if I've ever worked harder to get someone on the program than you. 
I was getting stiff-armed left and right. I see you on a million different shows, and I was starting to get a little sensitive about it all. And uh, I feel like we we did a lot of good work here. Do you we watch the Larry Sanders show? Uh, yes, of course. That's my favorite show, other than maybe The Sopranos and uh, Succession. Those are some of my favorite shows. And I think they're all HBO, which is why it was so great to work with HBO this year. And Larry Sanders, uh, I love the duality where they show the on-screen product and the backstage product. So the dynamic you're describing is like very, a very Larry Sanders of plot course. dynamic, That's right? And pretty... uh, this is like Tom Shales and Larry <laughs> in reverse. And uh, it was a big story. I heard everyone was mad at me. I was like, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. I sent a text. We, we went back and forth and that was it. You I know? love when Tom Shales is like very critical of Larry. And then Larry starts firing back at a critic on his, you know, using his monologue to fire back at a critic. And then he is going to fax him a fax, the fax that starts, you know, starts out insulting him in the very first line. And uh, Hank gets the fax <laughs> and receives it because Larry doesn't know how to use a fax machine. Okay. Now, uh, now I, now you've lost me on the analogy. I don't know. Okay. If this... The analogy is there. The analogy is there. Do you see okay. that? Like there was a perceived beef. Oh uh, God. <laughs> and there's like, somebody gets in the middle of it. And then it's like, well, you know, uh, now we're, we're, there's like a feud that's not even real. No, and no what? Yeah. Well, and if you say you said you thought I didn't like you. I know in my mind, I said there was no feud. That's why I was trying to clear the air. Well, no, there's nothing. Now we know. I, I like you. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that, Tony. Uh, congratulations on three years. Continued success to you and, uh, and the whole AEW team. Continued success to uh, the Jaguars other than when you play the Bills. Also, Fulham, heartbreaking loss for us. I'm a Nottingham Forest guy, so you beat us at uh, City Ground. We were up, and then you guys came back and beat us. You're up. a Not Forest supporter? That's my guy, yeah, yeah, that's my well, team. Well, we've had a very good, since I took over the the transfer, we've done very well at Not Forest, if you look. You know, yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate that. Uh, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure things out here. We just got promoted. I don't know if you know this, so. Well, that's not my uh, first year either. It was yeah, no, I know, back, but I'm, I'm not just talking this. about one. 22 yeah. signings was like a record. We were trying to, you know, get back on track. Uh, believe me, I believe me, nobody can relate more to yeah. what you're talking about more than me. So <laughs> I understand. I understand. Uh, thank you for the time, continued success, and hopefully down the line we can do this again. Yeah, this was great. Thanks for having me on, man. I've, I've, heard, I've heard nothing but great stuff, and I've really always enjoyed your show, and I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Ariel Hawani Show. If you want to check out some of our old episodes or if you want to stay up to date with all the great things that we are doing here, please do like and subscribe to this year page. Trust me, some really cool things are coming up.